Well, once a year, aside from some of the special services that we do, like Thanksgiving Eve service or Christmas Eve service, we uh, try to have most of the kids in the service with us, and this is that morning. I was told they do it to make sure I speak short, and uh, I'm somewhat entertaining. But let me just uh, uh, give, the, uh, give us an idea here of how many kids are here and how engaged they are. If you are uh, sixth grade or under, as loud as you can, Parents, you're going to want to close your ears, okay? As loud as you can, I want you to say booyah. Are you ready? The count of three. One, two, three. Booyah! All right, there's a few of you here. Others of you, your parents were like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> so anyway, kids, we're glad that you're in the service with us this morning. Hey, uh, in 1939, and this is a long, long time ago, but in 1939, the British government knew that World War II was coming, okay? There was no mystery there. The Germans were on the move. The, the Axis powers were kind of rolling through Europe, and they knew it was coming, and so they wanted to encourage the British people. And so uh, the government came up with this slogan that would help them and kind of be a quick reminder of what they need to do if nobody else was going to hold out. Remember, nobody knew the U.S. was going to enter the war about this time. They were hoping, they were lobbying, they were doing everything they could to get help. But by this time, uh, England was kind of figuring out, okay, I think we're going to be in this for the next few years, maybe even by ourselves. And so uh, the ministry there came up with a slogan that said, keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on. Now, they actually didn't release it. Uh, they wound up making thousands of these signs, and they thought, oh, man, maybe it's too trite. You know, are we pandering too much? And so they got rid of them all. And then in 2000, somebody found one of those signs, and this thing just went viral. And so you'll see this sign everywhere, keep calm and carry on, or some variation on it somewhere. There's a whole bunch of spoofs off of this uh, particular sign. My two favorites are, um, what is it, um, Keep Calm and Hammer Time, and Keep Calm and Pokemon, something like that. So I got a kick out of those. But um, the, the whole idea here is, listen, when, when times get rough, when, when it looks as if there's not a lot of hope on the horizon, what are we supposed to do? And in a very real sense, this slogan has kind of resonated with uh, not only the English people, the British, but really people all over the world. As we're reminded, that's right, I need to kind of calm down, keep calm, and I have got to figure out a way to carry on here. Uh, some of you are aware that I have three core values. Um, these are the three major mountains that I'll die on. And one of those is a value that says the journey is worthwhile. Uh, having uh, grown up in a house where I've seen my mom uh, suffer incredible physical pain and having been around the world and I've seen kids on garbage heaps digging for food. I've seen people living literally in cardboard shacks. And I've just seen... Uh, maybe more than uh, someone should when it comes to suffering. As a pastor, you get backroom passes, right, into all kinds of family suffering and all kinds of uh, medical situations and all kinds of um, um, places and positions in the world where this is where the rubber meets the road. And the conclusion that I've come to after looking at God's word and after seeing all of that is that in God's vernacular, all of it is worthwhile. That even the shortest of journeys... Even the briefest of lives is still worth it in God's vernacular. Everyone has value to God. This is one of the major reasons that I'm pro-life is because I think every single life is valued and loved by God. And I know that some people view lives as an inconvenience, but I think that is absolutely antithetical. It's the opposite of the heart of God. God says, no, that is not an inconvenience. I am looking to do something in and through you that you can't see through yourself. You may not like your journey, but trust me, the journey is worthwhile. So keep calm and carry on. And so we have been in the book of Hebrews as we have looked at how do we live by faith. What is faith? What's the foundation of it? And how do we live by it? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, and we're in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 3. We left off at verse 2 last week. We're going to pick it up at verse 3. Now, kids, this is something that's fairly new for you, so let me explain what's happening even as you're turning to uh, that passage in your Bible. Easy ways to find it. You can go to the table contents. If you have something digital, you can just tap. But generally, if you head right, you're going to get in the right vicinity. Okay, You're going to be in the right area. Uh, one of the things that we do is we read Scripture and we ask people to stand up. Now, 
Is it necessary that you stand in order to read scripture? Absolutely not. I just want to say that. But let me explain to you why we stand up, especially for the kids in the room. Uh, Kids, one of the things that we believe is that the word is the filter. We think the word is the filter. And we recognize that all of God's word is God-breathed. It's inspired. Now, we don't worship the Bible, but we worship the God of the Bible, the God who gives his word to us. And so we could approach this just like any other book, right? We could approach this like a Harry Potter book. We could approach it like a Dr. Seuss book. But instead, one of the things that we as a church have kind of recognized is that there is something special about this book. And one physical way that we try to do that is to stand up and honor God. In the Old Testament, they would stand in the reading of the scripture of God's word, right? It was a sign of honor. And even though that's an Old Testament practice, we understand that, yes, you can read scripture in a small group. That's, that's not a big deal. But we've just decided that one of the ways we want to honor God as a large gathering is to stand as we read his word. So now I'm guessing everybody's found their place. And let's stand up as we read God's word together. Beginning with verse 3, and we're going to read through to verse 17. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, We've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace. I mean, it's talking about the fruit of peace. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word, which we know is holy because you are holy and it reflects your character. Thank you, God, for your words, which separate bone from uh, flesh from bone, Father, and really helps us to discern what is us and what is you. I pray, Father, that you would give us the capacity to hear what you're asking of us this morning, hear what you're trying to communicate to us this morning. Is it possible that in that message that you want for us this morning, there might be greater life than the message we brought in with us this morning. And so we give you everything. We come to you available and receptive. In your son's name, amen. Have a seat. The first 10 chapters of Hebrews is all about the foundation of faith. Remember the audience. This is uh, the author's writing to a people who grew up in the church, who are familiar with Christianity. Um, Suffering is just now starting in the church. But what they've decided is it's not spiritualistic enough, right? Sometimes the deeply spiritual doesn't feel very spiritual, right? And so people begin to seek out a spiritualistic experience. And so they were uh, praying to angels and praying to ancestors and just trying to figure out a way to find a double rainbow and a unicorn somewhere so they could shed tears and feel as if God was doing some great work in their life. Now, In fact, God is doing a great work in their life. God was and is working through the saints always. They just didn't always feel that way. Ever been there? 
Sometimes life feels very mundane and ordinary. And so the author begins not by trying to get them to believe that somehow they should have this great emotional experience, but instead he starts with the foundation of faith. And he says, remember, Jesus really is God. Jesus really is 100% man. And he introduces this idea of suffering way back in chapter two. He talks about Melchizedek. He talks about a high priest. Jesus is the biggest hero. He lays the foundation for all of the things that allow us to be rooted and grounded in our faith so that when hard times come, when I go to college, when somebody comes in my life that genuinely asks a question that causes me to rock my world a little bit, when I hear a news report that gets me questioning the thing Things that I believe, the author is saying, when you hear all of those things, you are now rooted, you have a foundation upon which to stand so that you don't get shaken all that much, right? So that you're not like bouncing off the rails. You might sway in the wind a little bit, ask some good questions, but he wants your feet to be firmly planted in God's word. Now, having done that in the first 10 chapters, he moves on in chapter 11 to say, great, now that you have a foundation of faith, how do you live by faith? How do you live by faith? It's a great question. So he gives us a definition of faith. Remember the definition. Faith is not like sitting on a stool. Faith is like skiing down a mountain, right? It's counterintuitive. When you're looking down the steep face of a mountain, you think, no way I should ever lean that way. That makes zero sense. But the only way you're going to ski in life, the only way that you're going to manage something brand new that may seem impossible, but in fact is very possible, is by leaning forward. And that's what leaning forward in faith is. And so the author then begins to give examples of people. And he focuses not on their accomplishments, but he focuses on the process that led to those accomplishments. He reminds us, hey, when you look back, actually, see how it paid off? That's always helpful, isn't it? to start counting those blessings. He reminds us this is the process of faith. God wants to work in and through you in spite of circumstances that you may not be able to see. I know you can't feel it, but trust me, there is a process to this and there is an aim to this. What's the goal? Spiritual maturity. Spiritual perfection, not attainable. If you tell me you're spiritually perfect, I'm gonna run for the hills. But spiritual maturity is expected. So what's spiritual maturity? Spiritual maturity is the distance between God's call and our capacity to obey in the attitudes and actions of Jesus. And then if you remember, the author pauses in verse 16 of chapter 11. He says, by the way, none of this works if you're going to be double-minded about it, right? If you want to have one foot in the world, but I've got my friends, I've got to act this way, I've got to be this way, I've got the, Derek, you just don't understand the business climate I live in. Clearly you're not grounded in like the, where the world is at because I have to be this way to be accepted. But the author says, uh, forget being accepted. Accepted by God is the only thing that matters in your life. And stop then trying to live a life of faith because if you keep them both there, you're not getting very far. Your feet aren't long enough. You have to pick a side and you have to start walking in a direction. Okay? So the author ended that with saying, be single-minded, not double-minded. You can't have feet in both worlds. It just doesn't work that way. Then last week, the author reminded the reader that God loves to do the impossible. God loves to do the impossible. And he does the impossible. And a part of this litany of faith, a part of saying, remember so-and-so, remember what God did there? Remember when we thought that we were at the end of our rope, we couldn't pay that bill, and that kind of came through? Remember how this dropped so we could get there? And he just kind of reminds them all through this hall of faith, throughout history, going from Moses and Jacob and Isaac. And he begins to say, God loves to do the impossible, and he loves to do it through the improbable. The improbable, you and me. We're the improbable. We're, the mo- we're like the least likely candidate, right? If you could pick anyone on the planet that you think, God, you really should use them, right? You probably wouldn't start by saying right here, like I'm your guy, right? Like if you're looking for the most likely candidate, God, I don't want to brag, but I am the most humble guy on the planet, right? I mean, you need to like come this way first. He doesn't do that, right? Instead, most of us don't think that way, but God genuinely says, no, I want to use you. I want to use you. I want to use you. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. 
You don't get to dictate your journey to me. But God, I'm tired. I'm done. I've done my time. Just let me sleep. No, your life is mine. I can still use you. But God, I'm too young. They'll never listen to me. My feet barely touch the floor when I sit on the chair. No, you don't get to dictate that for you. God wants to dictate that for you. But when God is answering prayer, he loves to do the impossible through the improbable, but for the imperishable, for the things that are everlasting. So the author left us there last week. This week, as we were reading, the author begins to say, all right, now that you know those things, you need to start figuring out, in spite of any circumstances that come your way, how do you have peace wherever you are in life, whatever point of your journey on, with God and with your surroundings? And then how do you have peace in your relationships? Now, this is a huge topic. This is why the author in this passage harps on the fruit of peace. He talks about striving for peace. is because the author is trying to clue the reader in on, listen, you are chasing other things, and as you do that, you are not going to find the life of peace that you seek. In fact, I need you to begin to change your perspective, because if you're going to have peace in your circumstance, you've got to have perspective on that circumstance. And so the author begins really with the idea of discipline. Now, understand, you kids, you guys are thinking, oh man, you picked this passage out for me today so you could tell my parents that it's okay for them to discipline me, right? Like, this was the wrong Sunday to have this. I promise you this was not planned planned out that way, okay? We just kind of stumbled into this. And here's the uh, other part of that news, kids, if you're listening. uh, It's not just about discipline for you, but believe it or not, God is disciplining us. And what happens is, is how do we uh, view the the circumstances around us, the difficulties around us? Now, I said earlier, I've been around a while, and anybody who's been around a while and uh, has seen some difficult circumstances know that suffering comes in many forms. You know, uh, some suffering just happens because we live in a sinful world. The hurricane that blows through, you know why your house got blown down in that hurricane? Because there was a hurricane that came through, and everybody's house got blown down. You know, sometimes the result of having a disease, sometimes the result of uh, having a difficult or extraordinary circumstance has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that, congratulations, you live in a sinful world where things are constantly breaking down, where a new disease is born every day, where a new something is out to get you. That's just a part of the world that we live in. That's why the world is fallen. It doesn't take a genius to look around and go, yeah, you know, this is like not the nicest planet to be on. Why? Well, because if I go out in the jungles, right, something may come and get me. People, in fact, look at your parents or parents, if you think about your kids or grandparents, when you think about your grandkids, think about all the prayers you did for their safety. Lord, get them to school on time. Lord, please protect them as they're at the bus stop. Lord, I pray that, you know, you constantly think, well, those prayers all come from living in a fallen world. So sometimes suffering happens as a result of that. Other times suffering happens as a result of action-reaction. You know, I am stunned by how much blame God gets for our stupid decisions. And so people love to say, God, this is your fault. How could you do this to me? Well, what decision did you make? And oftentimes, you can see that train wreck coming like a mile away, right? And people around them are like, no, you want to make lots of decisions. Don't make that decision. But they take, it's like taking a tennis ball and throwing it against the wall. They take that ball and they say, no, I'm going to have my way. I'm going to go move in with so-and-so. I'm going to make this decision to have sex with so-and-so. I'm going to go over here, take this job. It's going to be my thing. It's going to be my time. I'm going to parent my kids the way I want to parent them, not the way you want me to parent them. And they throw the ball as hard as they can and they get surprised, genuinely shocked when the ball bounces back. Like, God, how could you do that to me? And God's going, well, you, you were the one who decided to throw Like, I was over here going, that's a bad idea. And you're like, no, no, I got this. And now you're surprised? So sometimes suffering is a result of that. Now, the author is not focusing on why we have difficult circumstances. That's not his point. His point is how God uses those circumstances toward his glory. How, what is our perspective on those circumstances? Because here's the truth. God can't touch you. I mean, sorry, not God, but uh, the devil can't touch you unless he has permission. The world can't do anything to you unless God allows it. 
So the question then becomes, well, why would God allow that? That's a good question, isn't it? Why would God allow that to happen? Okay. Here is what the author is saying. If you focus on the why too much, like why is this, why is that over there? You're going to go crazy. You're just going to start getting neurotic. You're going to pretend that you're God and you're going to try and outguess God in every situation. If you focus on what does this mean for me? What opportunity is this for me to respond in the attitudes and actions of Jesus? Then what you begin to realize is that even difficult circumstances are an opportunity to grow in holiness. That some of the most difficult moments that you are presented with may actually be moments and opportunities for greatness. We started with this idea of keep calm and carry on. Now imagine with me, if the British in 1941 just said, nope, we're done. History would not look back on them and go, wait, you had this opportunity, this moment of courage, this moment to show the world what you were made of. See, there are no French jokes about the British, right? The biggest French joke is, you know, do you remember the last time the French defended Paris? Well, neither do they. Right? So the French have this reputation of just surrendering and laying down. That's, not, that's kind of a bad reputation if you look at their history. But the problem is, in recent memory, we look at that action, you look at the action of the British in World War II, and you go, but they stuck it through. And that was their greatest moment. It was their greatest moment. You know, very often, God looks at us and goes, I know you don't like school. I know schoolwork is hard. I know maybe not all of your friends are really clicking. Maybe this person is teasing you and saying things. And listen, kids, when that happens and you're in school, Mama and Papa Bear, like we have conversations in our bedrooms, right? The first conversation we have is somebody, one or the other says, I want to go after those kids that are like, you know, coming at my kid, right? It's the first thing we do. The other person has to talk the other person off the ledge and say, listen, you know, this is a part of growing up. They've got to figure some of this stuff out, right? There's all these conversations that happen. But if you're worried about what conversations we're having, you're way behind the eight ball. That's not your concern. All you should be looking at is, okay, God, what is this going to say about me in the way that I respond more importantly, what does it say about you in the way that I respond? Now, some people take this idea of responding in a godly way to ungodly extremes. Uh, let me give you an example. Have you ever heard this? <laughs> I know, I just got in a car accident, but praise God. My house just burned down, but praise God, praise the Lord. Like, I'm so glad. What happened? I broke my leg. Praise God, I broke my leg. I know, I was in the hospital for weeks. Oh, that's wonderful. See, and those people feel fake. And you know why they feel fake? Because they are fake. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweat blood. He recognized the seriousness of the situation. But having a godly response does not mean having a pithy response to your circumstances. It's perfectly okay, read the Psalms, read a lot of scripture to go, God, why is this happening to me? Like, God, can you help me figure out a way? God, can you take care of that colleague at work? Because I can't see a way through this. But the psalmist or other parts of scripture never takes that and lets that drift off so that you begin to get bitter and you begin to act towards others in a way that is ungodly. What happens is it comes back around to say, but you, are God, oh God, are on the throne. You know more than I do. Man, I hope, God, that when they see me, they see you because I don't know how to control this. I don't know what to do. So I pray they see through me right to you. Give me the right words to say when my boss comes and said, why didn't you file that report? Give me the right attitude to have when someone comes and they make one of those passive-aggressive accusations. Like, how do I navigate that? And what the author is saying here is, listen, all of these moments are opportunities for God to discipline you. This is not about corporal punishment, right? This is not about spanking versus not spanking. Discipline is about instruction. What is he trying to instruct us toward? He's trying to instruct us toward holiness. This is the process of spiritual maturity. The author, in effect, is saying this. If you choose to bail, if you Choose to view your circumstances as the universe is out to get you rather than God is giving you an opportunity to respond. You will never 
Become the person that God wants you to be. Now that's a heavy thought. Think about it. It may just be that the thing that is holding you back from being God's instrument to absolutely change the planet is your unwillingness to view your circumstances from his perspective. And so it doesn't mean that the circumstances get any easier. It just means that we can have a peace about them. Okay, God, I don't know what's going on, but I do believe you're in control. Okay, God, (laughs) I said no to this. I'm looking at this. I don't know where we're going. I have mouths to feed, but my reliance and my hope is in you so that when they meet with me, I pray, God, that I'm not giving off some sort of a show that, oh, you could trust me. I've got it all under control. I just pray they see me rely on you. I pray, God, that you would do something in this moment that I can't do. And here's what the author has already reminded us. God loves to do the impossible. So how do you have peace with your circumstances? Well, first, you need to embrace God's discipline. God is shaping you. We always think about this in athletics, in athletic terms, right? That it's never fun to do all those push-ups and all those calisthenics and all those things, okay? It's just not a good time. I know there are some people that you know, they just lay wake up in the morning just living to sweat. I, I understand that. But for most people, if you're training for something you're not used to doing, right, it's just, it's, it's achy. It hurts. The reason you have coaches is so they can push you farther than you've ever been pushed before. Because you would never tell yourself to do all of that on a summer day for a football game, ever. But the coach believes that you're capable of more and the coach sees the end game in a way that you can't see it. The coach actually has a training schedule in mind. The coach actually knows what he wants. So the author is reminding us of that. But the author then takes us from there and he says, but not only peace in your circumstances, but you need to let God align your position. So as you're going through this, you need to be thinking about how you are positioned in life. Uh, In our huddle this last week, uh, Josh Christian brought uh, up a a football illustration. He said he was in high school and when he was in high school, he played football and he played on the D-line and the O-line. That's defensive line and offensive line. That was my football speak for the day. Um, And he said they were really uh, super hyper-focused on his positioning, right, his form. And he he made an extraordinary statement in our huddle. He said, it wasn't just to protect me from injury. It was also because if I got hurt, that hurt the team. So the author begins to take this idea of having adjustment and he starts to move our focus from peace from circumstances to peace with others. But why do we need the adjustment, right? Well, it's discipline. Well, how does that feel? How does that look? So he uses this passage, (laughs) which is a great passage. But he says, you know, take your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Now, the idea here is not, (sighs) whoop, right? The idea is not like a literal drooping hand. Or have you ever had someone, uh, guys get this a lot, hopefully by great older men who know better. But you'll, every now and again, you'll see this youth, this teen, will just like slouch. You'll see this guy go, straighten up, son. Right? It, it, the author isn't describing that. This is not God saying, oh, stand up, soldier. Hup. This is not that. This is l- literally, he's describing an adjustment. And so to give us an idea of how something is adjusted, I have uh, asked Don Cowart, who is a chiropractor in Naperville, to come on up and describe for us a little bit. I've got uh, three questions for him. I was really hoping there was a skull in this thing so I could say, I'd kill you, but um, <laughs> it's not that. Let me make sure you have a mic here. There's an orange mic. There we go. Um, Don told me earlier, it's really nice that Melissa gave me my spine back. Anyway. So uh, just a few questions here for Don. So Don, how does something get out of alignment? What does it mean that something is out of alignment? Well, our body's full of joints. Two ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, elbows, wrists. It's easy to understand when you step into a, a hole when you're doing your running in the morning and you twist your knee, the ligaments, tendons, which are the rubber band-like hinges of all the joints in the body, they get overstretched. And like a rubber band that gets overstretched, that joint becomes unstable. It becomes over-mobile, loose. 
the joint starts to grind, it starts to swell, anything inside that joint becomes uh, irritated, swollen, compressed. Well, that's easy to understand, but let's take it up a notch and we'll look at this structure. There's 48 joints in this structure, that's your spine. The head's here, the low back's here. The spine is not one solid column of bone. It allows you to move, twist, bend, so there's 24 bones in this spine with a joint on either side. 48 knee joints, 48 elbow joints, and they're held together by the same ligaments and tendons that all the other joints in the body are held together by. So if you sprain your knee, the ligaments get over loose, the joint starts to grind on itself instead of glide, that joint becomes swollen and irritated. Same thing happens with these 48 except this is a spinal joint. The brain sends the spinal cord down through these joints. So that swelling not only causes local joint pain, but it causes swelling and choking on that nerve root. So you get a whole different set of symptoms, that nerve pain. So you have to identify that pothole that you stepped in this morning when you were running. And are you going to step in it tomorrow morning? I'll bet you don't. <laughs> no, no. Well, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a complicated thing. And you mentioned kind of getting irritated. Beyond kind of getting irritated, I know that there are some swelling points. When something gets out of alignment, I mean, is the indication of that, I mean, how painful can it get if something is out of alignment? Well, the lining... Are hospital or like how does it work? Well, first you want to you identify what causes the problem and try to modify it or change it so you don't do it again. But... We're humans, and we don't do that very well, so those joints, ankles, knees, spinal joints, they can become unstable and weak, and they become very uh, um, easy to re-injure. Now, the linings of the joint have tremendous amounts of nerve endings that send pain, and with a spinal joint, you also have these large spinal nerves, and that's, that's where the pain and all the sensations are transmitted, so it's very painful. And as you keep re repetitively re-injuring it, that pain increases as the instability starts to become more and more prevalent. Okay, so the pain increases as the instability becomes more prevalent, and you're a chiropractor. So I'm going to assume that it's really, like, this is not something you can just fix yourself. You have to have someone outside of you that comes in and, I guess, pops it back where in the right position where it should be. Is that right? <clears throat> That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, uh... It's time for an adjustment. No, just kidding. Yep, time, yep. yep. Well, All right, so um, uh, just one other question, and that is, um, when, once these things are in place, right, and so you have all this stuff that's in the right position, yeah. these 48 things, how easy is it for it to get out of place? You, at one point we were talking, you said something about your ligaments, your muscles are trying to actively pull it back in the old spot. You have to kind of retrain it, is that true? Yeah, muscle memory, joint memory, ligament, tendon memory, the joint capsules of these muscles... They're, used, they're set up and they're designed in a very, very uniform fashion where they want to tighten up. Usually it's about 36 hours after you sprain the joint. Those, those supportive structures, the ligaments, they want to start to re-knit and tighten up. But if they do so holding that joint in a sprained alignment, there's going to be problems and instability ahead. So those joints, the capsules of the shoulders, elbows, knees, ligaments, ankles, spinal joints, they all want to tighten back up to the way they were designed. And if you don't rehab them, they tighten up, holding those joints in the sprain position, and they wear out a few decades ahead of schedule. Got it. Thank you so much, Don. Let's give Don a round of applause. And the spine, a round of applause. As well. <laughs> yeah. Don't give Melissa my spine back. No, no, that's not a good idea. Um, so the idea here is that someone outside of you has to come in. That's what God wants to do. And it doesn't always feel like it's, it feels great once it's popped back in, but the process of getting it back in isn't always the most comfortable, okay? But you have to let God do that. Now, that's peace in circumstances. So by doing that, now you have peace with others. Why? Because you're less irritable. Fair enough? So the author turns his attention to three different things. The first thing he says is you need to um, uh, have grace, Right? The grace of God with others. Now, this is pretty basic stuff, but it's funny. When your life is under stress and under the pressure cooker, it's amazing how short-tempered you can be. Have you ever noticed that? You know, when uh, I'm working on a project and trying to put something together in the house, um, and I've got people around me trying to tell me how to do it right, um, my fuse, although I have a long fuse, 
but it tends to run just a little shorter in that moment. You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes I'll have to, I'll say something and I'll have to wind up coming back and go, look, I didn't mean to say that as short as I did. I'm sorry. I didn't, you know, because what happens is sometimes the strain and stress of life and uh, teens, you know this, right? Just a a small comment. You've got this situation happening in your life. It's out of your control. It's really frustrating to you. You come home, your parents look at you and go, so how was your day? You're like, shut up. And you slam the door of your room, right? You overreact, right? And then your parents think, oh, you're not going to talk to me. No, I'm just gonna, there's a whole scenario there. But anyway, the whole point there is that sometimes we way overreact to our situation. So the first thing that God says is, listen, when you're under the cooker, when you're trying to grapple with your circumstances, remember to first be gracious. Have my grace. Let my grace pour through you. This is not because you're superhuman. This is the moment where you rely on God and you say, okay, because of him, I need you to do those things that I'm not capable of doing. The second thing he says is to get rid of all bitterness. To get rid of all bitterness. Now, what is bitterness? Bitterness is where you allow something to to fester by itself and you begin to dwell on it, right? Misery loves company. Guess what? Your own internal misery loves its own company too. It's amazing how something will get in there especially relationally with someone else, and they'll do something because that's what the author has turned our attention to, not just the individual, but the the collective, right, the body. And he's essentially said, listen, when this is irritated, right, it impacts everything else. And what you can start to do is think about what the other person did or didn't do, and you can start to dwell on that, and that'll start to replay, and you'll start to create scenarios in your mind and in your heart that actually make it really bad. It starts to get, it starts to fester and infect everything about you. So you can't even look at that in the other individual anymore, right, without getting bitter. I was reading uh, one of the commentaries, and this a gentleman by the name of Moffat said it this way. He said, the writer might be throwing out a hint to his readers that suffering was apt to render people irritable and impatient with each other's faults. Wow, big surprise. The later record, but listen to this, even of the martyrs, for example, shows that the very prospect of death did not always prevent Christians from quarreling in prison. So we always think of Paul and Silas in prison, singing songs, right? People getting saved because they're in there singing songs while they're in prison. Do you know that a lot of Christians, as they knew they were going to their death and they're under that strain and they're uncomfortable and there are rats and there's horrible, you know, situations and conditions, do you know that they reacted like we would? Like, just shut up for a second. Stop singing. Just leave me alone. Let me collect my thoughts. They started to interact with each other in a quarreling way. And so the author is reminding them here that even though your, dif- your circumstances may be difficult, God wants to use those, view those as an, o- as an opportunity. Step one, try to show grace to the next person because they're struggling alongside with you. Step two, don't hold on to any slights. Just don't hold on, just let it go, right? Like in curling. Just let it go. Just give it to God. Now, At the end of this passage, the author gives us the third thing. And he says, first, be sexually pure. Don't be sexually immoral. The word word there is porneo, okay, pornography. And it has to do with just uh, being, uh, choosing to uh, act out sexually. By the way, very, very common for people under stress, especially for couples. And so often what you'll hear uh, in conjunction with an affair is that someone will say, they'll describe the circumstances of their life and their outlet for that will be some sort of a sexual experience. Okay, so the author says that, but then he moves right to Esau and he traded in all of his blessing for a single meal. And you're like, dude, pick a lane. Like, what are we talking about here? But in fact, the author has chosen a lane and really what he's relating it to is immediate gratification. You remember the story of Esau. Esau is hungry. He doesn't want to defer his hunger. So he takes the meal and in exchange for giving up his birthright and his blessing. And the author is saying people do that sexually, right? Don't give in to that sexual impulse. That is immediate gratification, and it's not going to help you in the long run. It's not even really going to help you in the short run. You think it's going to give relief, both however that looks. I got to go buy that thing. I got to go do that thing. I got to go get that thing. I got to go talk to that person. 
I got to go have that conversation. Whatever immediate gratification looks like in your life, you need to at least have some point in there where you go, what? is this just me seeking relief? And is this perhaps a moment where God is saying, I need you to stick it out? Now, in the ESV, this passage ends with Esau saying, even though he sought repentance, he wasn't given it. Or I think that the verse specifically was, um, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is not Esau seeking for forgiveness. Anytime someone asks for forgiveness, God loves to forgive. This is not that. This is Esau seeking for some reversal of the consequences that he was to reap. And in a very real way, what the author is saying is, some things you can't get back. Once you have sex, you are no longer a virgin. And no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you beg, no matter how much you plead, guess what? Your virginity is gone. Esau lost his birthright, came right back to daddy. But can't you reverse it? Isn't there something else you can do? Don't you have a small piece? Is there anything, God? I blew it. I don't know what to do. Come on, Dad. This is not about forgiveness for the choice that I made. This is you need to fix my circumstance. You need to change the consequence. I I don't want a spanking. I don't want a timeout. I don't want you to take that away from me. So I'm going to try and do something so that you can't The author is saying, guess what? You're not the parent in this scenario. Some things can't be taken back. So the author is saying, don't pursue the immediate gratification because you may find yourself in consequences. Remember that other lane of circumstantial suffering? You may find yourself dealing with things that actually you caused. Now, There is always hope. And what's the hope here? God longs for our holiness. God hasn't gone anywhere. God may not alter the circumstance, but he does want us to alter our reaction. And so when we cry out to God, we go, okay, God, forget them. This is me. This is my fault. I was wrong. Do you know what one of the most beautiful moments for a parent is? When you discipline your child and you know they deserved it. By the way, my dad was amazing at discipline. My dad was phenomenal at it. You know, way better than I was. I tried to model it after him, but... Honestly, I didn't come close. He would sit me down. He would say, okay, now tell me why you're about to get punished. I would have to tell him why I had to get punished. Then he would say, okay. And then he would say, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. He was very honest about it, right? And then, you know, he would let me know. And then so I knew that everything that I got, I absolutely deserved. And he never did it out of anger. It was always for my best interest. And I knew that. But I think the most, now having kind of raised three sons of my own, I think the, one of the most beautiful moments is when the child comes back to you and they go, I'm really sorry. I, I was wrong. And I don't know a good parent alive who at that moment doesn't go, I am too, come here. Come on. It doesn't mean the consequence goes away. It just means the relationship is restored. That the consequence and the decisions are on the right person. By the way, adults, that's really nice to do with kids because things are so far out of their control. And by the way, I don't want to be a kid again, right? (laughs) Because I remember what it was to like have to do this and have to do that and like sit and do all the stuff that they ask you to do. By the way, kids, the thing you need to know is that stuff doesn't go away. The older you get, you just get piled on. There's just more, okay? But adults, this also applies to us. Because even though you think you have freedom of choice, if you belong to Jesus, there's no choice at all. It's whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, as uncomfortable as it may be, I will go to the furnace. And there, I will find you who meets me at my greatest point of need.